The good, the bad, and the ugly. There we go. There's the guy ready for action. For those that like, like Western movies and you've watched all of them, I'm sure you've watched the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's all there in the storyline and the gold they're looking for. And uh, Clint Eastwood plays a good role in there as well. And so maybe what category do you fall in this morning? The good, the bad, or the ugly? Now, someone said to me before the service, please don't call out categories. Don't say we've got the good, yeah, we've got the... No, there's no ugly people. There's no ugly people in the kingdom of God. Amen. God made all of us beautiful in His sight. And I'm going to read a scripture to you today. And I'm going to take out of this scripture the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's going to be three points in the sermon. But I want you to... Really ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart this morning about what we're speaking about this, this morning. And so we're going to go to Mark chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. This is after Jesus goes to the house of Levi or Matthew, as you know him. Remember, Matthew was a tax collector. How many of you love the tax man? You love the tax man? Hi, Chantal. We don't like the tax man. Chantal, you're such a law-abiding citizen. How many of you like it when the petrol prices go up? You go, Yes! I'm only going to drive around the corner though, these days. I'm not going to get much further than that. Uh, Jonathan is always crying because he drives a V6 bucky. Oh, that thing's heavy on juice, but he was blessed with it, amen, from his uncle. And so we, we sometimes come to this place, and the tax collectors in those days were seen as people that were dishonest. I mean, people that weren't loved by everybody. And so Mark chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, he speaks about the story of Jesus going to the house of Levi. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors, the worst of the worst, and sinners, when Jesus, I think lawyers are in there as well, so... Uh, just joking. <laughs> when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Isn't it a powerful scripture here? Jesus comes, he calls Levi or Matthew to follow him, a tax collector sitting there collect, collecting the taxes that is needed in the time, good law abiding citizens, but those people were not honest people. The Pharisees come. They come to Jesus there. The scribes come. They see Jesus and the disciples mixing with sinners. Oh, imagine mixing with sinners. You Christians, how can you mix with sinners? How can you sit down and have a meal with the sinner? You'll be unclean. You can't touch things that are unclean. In Jesus' day, the law was against it. You see, for, for those Pharisees to mix with anyone that was unclean, that was ceremonially unclean, that wasn't uh, washed uh, with the right ceremonies and under the law and Jewish and so forth. And so those days, even the things that they touched were unclean. So even the cutlery that Jesus was eating with, even the plate he was eating out of, was seen as unclean by these Pharisees. That's why they went, oh, Jesus sitting with sinners. Why is he cis, man? How can he sit with these people? How can he relate with these people? How can he sit with the prostitute? How can he walk with the drunkard? How can he encourage the drug addict? How can he? How can Jesus go to this house of this tax collector? And they were indignant and they were angry. And so we see three categories of people in the story when you read it. And the first one is the good, and that's Jesus. Because the Bible says only God is good. How many of you know about this? You see, none of us are good. Look at the person next to you. Tell them you're not good. <laughs> Come on. Some of you like to claim to be good. You're not good. Thank you. Exactly. You know what that statement does? It takes the boast away in the flesh. It takes the boast away in ourselves because the minute we start thinking we're good people is the minute we move away from the, the, the need to have Christ in our life. The minute we say, what well, we're good people, we're good, we're good, we're good. Good people don't go to heaven. Unfortunately, that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches people that belong to Jesus goes to heaven. Spiritual people go to heaven. Born again people go to heaven. But good people are not going to heaven. You can do all the good deeds you want to. You can feed the poor. You can give all your money away this morning to an orphanage. And say, I'm going to heaven. That does not buy your ticket to heaven. You can be in church every Sunday. I need some amens. You can... Do the good works. You can go evangelize all week long. That doesn't give those good works does not count towards your heavenly account. 
You see, the goodness that we have is in Jesus. That's why He's called good. That's why God alone is good. We have flesh that we carry around. And let me tell you, the flesh is not a good thing. This. All of us that are even sitting in church, there's times where you have to come and you have to resist when the devil comes and puts temptation right at your doorstep. You're going to go through temptations until the day you die. You're not immune to temptation, but you are immune to say, I can say no to temptation because that temptation will lead to sin and sin will lead to death. You see, there's always a progression with the devil. He's got a long-term plan. He's got the long game in in mind. He doesn't worry about exactly right now. He'll come dressed up the way you want him to be dressed up. He'll come packaged the way you want him to be packaged. You see, the enemy comes and he's a very good marketing manager. How many of you into marketing here? Packaging. Eh? That package has to look good when you see something. That's why people buy from Woolies, because the stuff looks so good in the packaging. I mean, it looks like it was just cleaned off. Someone just washed it 500 times and put it there's the strawberry. It looks like it was glazed with something. Like, woo, it's like the angels sing when you see that strawberry. And the lights come on and you see it glistening in the light. You see, that's what the devil does. He makes the thing look so juicy and so good that you say, mm. isn't that what Eve said? This fruit looked good for eating. It looks, looks good to the sight, to the eye. It looks good for eating for the body. And so they took of it. But the bad is the sinners. Amen? Those that were sitting in sin. Jesus was sitting with the sinners around the table. The tax collectors in need of a Savior. That's why he sat with them. He knew that they were lost. You see, people that are sinners, the very definition of sin, of sinners is that they sin. I think sometimes in the church we expect people that are sinners to act like saints. Why do you waste your time? Because you say, oh, look how those people are acting. Well, if a person doesn't belong to Jesus, that's exactly the way they're going to act. They're going to do the things of this world. They're going to listen to the flesh. And that's why we cannot afford for the church to look like the world. The church cannot look like the world and the world like the church. There has to be a differentiation between the church and the world. There has to be a clear line. When someone meets a Christian, they must know they're meeting with a Christian. They must know the fruit that's coming from them is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all of the fruit of the Spirit coming through them, touching people's lives. There must be a difference. It's only dead fish that go with the flow. Amen? And so the bad, the sinner in need of a Savior. How many of you know all of us at some stage, needed Jesus. Maybe even this morning, you're online. Maybe you're sitting in church this morning saying, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've just, I've just come to church. I've just expected to go in because I'm in church. It's as much as parking or sleeping in the garage and expecting to wake up as a Ferrari the next day. <laughs> Amen? How many of you try to sleep in the garage and the next morning you're a Ferrari? Whatever car you drive. I don't think we drive Ferraris, many of us in the church. Amen? But sinners in need of a Savior. And the ugly... Here comes the ugly ones in this first story. They come from the side. They come from the sideline criticizing, saying, Jesus, why are you sitting with these sinners? Well, you know, don't you know this is breaking the laws here? Don't you know that they're unclean? Don't you know that you're going to be unclean if you just touch them or associate with them or drink out of the same cup or eat from the same plates? Jesus, here comes the Pharisees. They're the dead religious people. That's the ugly that we face. Amen. How many of you know what's the one, number one reason for people not coming to church? And it's not the devil. What's the number one reason for people not coming to church? It's the ugly. It's the ugly Christians. Amen? It's the ugly Christians around us. It's the ones that are prickly pear Christians. How many of you know prickly pear Christians? You can't touch it with a raw paw, as Baloo says in uh, Mowgli in in that movie, Jungle Book. eh? You see, prickly pear Christians are those that say, I love God, but I don't love people. How many of you know that? I love to come to church. I'm religious. I'm in church every Sunday. But nobody likes me outside of the church. Nobody wants to come close to me. Nobody sees love coming from me. Nobody sees compassion coming from me. I'm a prickly pear Christian. Amen? People don't want to touch a prickly pear. How many of you have had those little thorns in your fingers before? It's annoying, man. Prickly pear season. I love to eat those. One after the other. You put them in the fridge after you've peeled them. Oh, like uh, trucks fire. Eh? Come on. Tolofia. Huh? I remember there in, in Utenay, I used to go to school in Utenay, and the guys used to come down the street, Tolofia, Tolofia, ta, 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 ta. knock on the gates, selling prickly pears from gate to gate, because the prickly pears are just right there by Utenay, and we used to eat tons of those things, but you get those little thorns in, 
And that's such an annoying thing to get that thorn. You can't see it. You, can't, you can feel it's pricking you. And we don't want to be those Christians that people come in touch with you and they don't see anything of Jesus. All they see is a religious person that tells them they're going to church, but at work they act the opposite. How many of you have seen those people? And the bad thing is when you start working with them. <laughs> now you come from the church and you apply there. You go work with them. You see, Ooh, this Tani or this Wimpy, when he was in church, he looked so good. But come to the workplace, the devil will come out in this place. <laughs> you see, the thing is, God's looking for people that are consistently following off him. Monday to Sunday, not just Sunday to Sunday. You see, sometimes people act on a Sunday. Have the Bible, cars even polished. Hair is polished, everything is polished, the teeth are polished, you smell good on a Sunday, you look good, you come to church, you smile even at the people, you walk out, and as soon as you walk out, you take all of that polish off, and the real you comes out. With the real Slim Shady, please stand up. Mm. See, God is not looking for Pharisees. God is not looking for people that say we're good on the outside, but we stink on the inside. God is wanting to change our lives. And so we get the good, the bad, and the ugly in church even. We get those that come to church and they fall into the bad category. They, they, they say they've come to salvation. They even came up for a prayer to the front, but their life has not changed behind the scenes. They continue with the same habits year after year, month after month, week after week. They never change. So the bad still continues in their life and it still robs from them, still destroys. The enemy is still having a foothold in there. You see, the enemy loves it when you keep that door open for him to keep coming into your life. It's time that we shut the door on the enemy, that we shut the door on the bad so that the influence of the enemy can't come in. You see, the enemy needs legal right into your life. How many of you know this? He can only do what you allow him to do. And so many of our Christians have been allowing the enemy to rob from us, to steal from us, to destroy in our lives. It's time that we close those doors that he's staying open. You see, secret sin is not secret sin at all. Every sin is open before the Lord. How many of you know that every sin in every category counts the same? I mean, sin is sin. Sin is against God. It is displeasing to God. It's sinning against our perfect Father. And so if that sin is hidden, it's not really hidden from God because God sees everything. It might be hidden from people, but what will happen is it will destroy your life slowly in the silence, slowly in the darkness. Everything that's kept in the dark, the enemy can use. Do you know this? If you can think of anything in your life that's in the dark right now, the enemy will use it against you. He will rob you. He will steal from you. He will continue to take from you. Let's talk about the good. I love to talk about the good. In this story, it's Jesus, and we can move to the next slide. Leviticus 19, verse 17 to 18. Jesus on the law of love. How many of you know there was a law of love even in the Old Testament? You can go read it in Leviticus, but we're going to read from Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Let's just stop on that slide. Listen to that. Did you really have to read that scripture this morning, Julius? Do I really have to love those that hate me? Listen to that category. It says here, but I say to you, love your enemies. Where upon this earth do people love their enemies? They normally hate their enemies. They normally have anything against their enemies. Then it says there, they normally repay evil with evil against the enemy. Bless those who curse you. Whoa, have you had people curse you? People curse you with their words. They speak against you. They have nothing good to say about you. Bless those who curse you. You see, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of the opposites. If we act like the world, how will we stand out from the world? If someone comes against you, you don't have to overreact and fight fire with fire. You don't have to gouge your eye out because your eye was gouged out. I mean, you have to turn the other cheek. Now, we can test that this morning. We won't test the devil. Do you want to volunteer? He doesn't want to volunteer this morning. Ask Jonathan, yeah, he's, uh, where is Jonathan? <laughs> he can take a slap. We've done it before. Eh? You see these guys have a sport these days of slapping each other. Have you seen that? Yo, some of these guys are tough, man. They slap a guy so hard that he wants to pass out. The other guy slaps him back again. I don't know. Culture has really become funny. Eh? We, we enjoy watching people hurting each other. 
we'll have a slapping competition here at church one day, and then you can really sign up for the person you always wanted to slap in church. He will say, Kevin, I always wanted to slap you. I'm signing up for the slapping competition against you. How's that? Shall we do a list around the church and see who you're signing up to partner against? Then we know who your enemies are. And those are the lists of people you must put down to pray for and bless and say, Lord, oh, I know they don't like me, but I'll have to bless them. Oh, they're so tough, Jesus, please. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength to love people that we don't want to love, to pray for people we don't want to pray for, to bless those that curse you. Wow, you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I think about doing good for people that hate you. If someone starts bringing you presents next week in church, you know that they're doing the opposite of what they really feel on the inside. They're counteracting this hatred towards you. Say, I felt I should bless you with something. Now, if they do and it's not the case, just forgive them. Amen. <laughs> you need to love them anyway. It counts for you as well. So bless people. That hate you. Don't speak evil with evil. Don't do use what the enemy does. Because it says there in the next part that you may be sons of your father and daughters in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You see, revenge is up to God. God will bless everybody. God will, God will deal with those that treat you badly. God will deal with them in their hearts. God will deal with them in their lives. The seeds that they sow, they will reap. You don't have to do that. You're not the grim reaper. I mean, you're not the one that must take revenge. You're not the one. And can you think of someone that really hurt you in your past? Can you think of someone that you don't really like much right now? If it's me, please forgive me. <laughs> don't throw big stones. Bring fraud tomatoes to church, you know? I know some of you supporters from some hooligans from those soccer teams, you know. Eh? You see, at the end of the day, this morning you can think of someone that you've got something against. And the Bible says love them. Because you know why? It shows you who you belong to. It shows the world that you belong to your Father in heaven. It's a reflection of who God is. And the Bible says that God is love. Do you love the same way as Father God does? And let's go to the second part of that scripture. Verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Hmm? If, you, if you're good to the tax man, he's good to you. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Isn't that beautiful? You see what this is talking about in, in respect to the law, to have perfection in fulfilling the law. The word teleos is the Greek word that they use here in respect to the law, to have that perfection towards the law. In other words, to do what God has called us to do, and that's to love people. That's to love your neighbor as you love yourself. My kids, when we grew up, my kids used to ask me, Dad, who are you waving at? Well, my wife used to say, do you know that guy? <laughs> do you know that people you're waving at? I wave at everybody. Have you know people like that? I drive past and I'm like, my kids used to play the sweet and sour game. They wave at people. If they, if they don't wave back, they sour. If they wave back, they sweet. I mean, if they greet. And so I do the same. I greet everybody if I walk past. In actual fact, my brother and I, Leo, the one who's also in the ministry in Joburg, we get highly upset when people don't want to greet us. I'm on the other side of the spectrum. If I walk past someone and I greet them, and I look at them, I say, Gees, yeah? And Gees just walks past. Hmm. I say, what an the fark. <laughs> then I have to repent again when I walk away. But you know, like, I have an expectation on people. My, maybe Chase is a sinner. He doesn't want to greet me. Or maybe he's just a sour Christian that was baptized in lemon juice before he came to church. Like some of you, you've received lemon juice this morning before you got up. You know, I don't know where you get these doses of lemon juice from, but some of you, even when you crack a joke in church, God doesn't like jokes in church. I don't know which God you serve. The Bible are full of very funny moments. And I find that the sense of humor of, that God has is very great. I mean, it's the greatest sense of humor that God has. And so this morning, we need to do the opposite. We are counterculture of the world. We're an upside-down kingdom. The kingdom of this world will build up. You tramp on people. You hate those that hate you. You repay those with fire that fire against you. You do things against someone that they did for you. No, our kingdom that we belong to is ups upside down. We love those. We bless those. We speak well of them. We even shower them with gifts. We do things for them, even those that we don't. And you know what's going to happen is, they're going to see the Father in you. They're going to see Jesus in you. 
and they're going to want to know, even though I've been so ugly to you, Vanessa, why are you so nice to me? Why are you blessing me? Why are you continue to bless me? And then eventually they realize it's because Jesus lives inside of you. And I want that Jesus that you have. I want to be that person that you are. I want to live like you do. Even if you don't like your neighbors, it's time to <laughs> start blessing your neighbors. Leave a little gift on their doorstep and say, from your loving neighbor. Your dogs did keep me up last night, but I still love you. <laughs> Here's some treats for your dogs. How's that? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that neighbor go like, what? Yes. I know some of you don't like your neighbor's dogs. Okay, let's get to the bad. We've been on the good. We're going to the bad. You ready for the bad? Oh, I don't know about this. The bad. How bad is sin? Let's go to the next slide. Next. Okay, there we go. How bad is sin? How bad is sin? It's a death penalty. That's how bad. At its worst case, sin is a death penalty. Romans 6 verse 23. If you ever want to share the gospel with someone, here's a scripture that actually takes the bad and the good and it brings us to the good side. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23. It's a death penalty. Sin will always pay out in death. Amen? The wages of sin is death. When you work for wages, you get money for your work. You get money for the work you've done. The same way, if you live in sin, it will pay out in death. Not only death physically, but death spiritually, that you'll be separated from God eternally and you'll end up in a place called hell. Nobody needs to go to hell. Nobody wants to go to hell. God didn't design us to go to hell, amen? You and I are there here on this earth to get people to heaven. We're not here to tell them, continue to tell them they're going to hell. We continue to tell them that there's a better way and it's called the way to heaven. And the place to go to is to church and the place to find it there or the person to find is Jesus. And when you hear about Jesus and the good news that he saved you, while you were a sinner, while you were still blaspheming against God, not loving God, you see God is the same as what God is expecting of us. He's exactly like that. He loved us before we did anything right. Anything. Rotten sinners. He still loves you and dies for you on the cross. Now this scripture, I love it. If you want to share the gospel with someone, go write down Romans 6.23. Are you going to share the gospel with someone in this week? You see the bad news is in the beginning of the scripture. For the wages of sin, you can explain to them like this. Sin will pay you out in death. If you continue on this path, you're going to end up in a destination. If you continue to do what you're doing and separate it from God, there is no life for you. But listen to the good news that comes. But, after the comma, the gift of God, that which God has done for you in Christ Jesus is eternal life. Amen. You see, he bridged the gap. You can even, you can go check. There's a video online on this, YouTube, how to share the gospel according to Romans 6.23. You can draw it. Some guys have drawn it in pizza, on pizza boxes. You know those pizza boxes you get? You've drawn it on there, on a piece of paper. You can sit around a table with some people and say, let me tell you a little bit about the good news. Here's the good news. You can put your sin on this side, which ends up in death, in the chasm at the bottom. Then you draw one on the other side. On this side is the, the gift of God, or, or this side is eternal life. And how do I get to that eternal life to cross this chasm of sin and death? I, I, the cross falls in there, which is through Christ Jesus. Now, you might be separated from God right now, but if you want to be united with Jesus or with God, it comes through Jesus. Amen. He paid the full price. He bridges the gap between sin and eternal life in Christ. And so you and I need to receive what Christ did on the cross. And there you've got the gospel. You can bridge over into life now. You don't have to die in that chasm in the middle. The separation between you and God doesn't have to, have to stay there forever. And how many of you know many people are separated from God right now? It's time that we become serious about getting the lost saved in the church. Amen. The bad. How bad is sin? Let's go on. Let's look at it. Next slide. The battle between the flesh and the spirit. Ooh, we don't like this one. What is the battle between the flesh and the spirit? Paul writes about it. He writes about it. He tells us about this battle that's going on between the flesh and the spirit in Galatians 5, 19 to 23. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, Orgies and the like, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
These are the things that separate people from God. These are the things that are obvious in the world. These are the things that we say God can forgive and we can be united with Him. What happens when you come to Christ? In the next verse, 22 on the next slide, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is... Kindness. Some of you are faster than others. Where is your... Where is your... Where is your... Where is your <laughs> Amen. The fruit of the Spirit... Listen to that. It says, and against such there is no law. This is what happens when you belong to Christ. These things begin to show on the outside. I love what it says. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces it. You don't produce it by yourself. You cannot produce it. Only through the Spirit of God can you produce love. Only the way that you need to love people. How many of you know this is the kind of love, the agape love that's sacrificial? How many of you know I can only love my wife in the way that she deserves if I belong to Jesus, and if the Spirit of God is full up in me, the minute that I move away from Christ is the minute that I ill-treat my wife. It's the minute that she says, no, Julius, man, you're not that young man, that handsome guy that I met so many years ago. <laughs> okay, that's age, my dear. Okay, you don't, you don't write those poems anymore like you used to. You don't bring those flowers anymore like you. I used to do, I used to do these things, eh? Write poems to my wife, flowers, yeah. All of this stuff. You see the young men at the back going, I'm still going to do it. Are you doing it already, John? Ah, okay. Mom, we must find out who the girl is that's receiving the poems and the flowers so far. Amen. But the things is, the things you do because you love, because it doesn't come from the flesh. It comes from much deeper than that. Then it becomes a fruit of the Spirit. How many of you know it's difficult to have peace in this world? I'm finding it tough these days to have peace. I only have to look at the news. I only have to read the newspaper. I only have to look at the articles online and say, wow, there goes my peace out the door. I just start a conversation with someone talking about the corruption that's going on. And there goes the peace out the door. You see, the thing is, when peace is produced, when love is produced from the Spirit of God, no one can take it away from you. It's not flesh deep. It's heart deep. It's spirit deep. Amen. It's where it comes from that matters. And when the spirit produces it, it keeps on producing. That's why your relationship with God is important. That's why reading the word of God is important. That's why it's important to come to church so that I can remind you to live according to the spirit and not to the flesh. Who's winning the battle in your life between the spirit and the flesh? We're going to close with the ugly. Hey, let's go to the ugly. Don't tell the person next to you that they're ugly. Okay, please don't. We want some forgiveness here. Listen to this. The ugly of dead religion. How many of you know that the ugly of dead religion is rife in the church? The ugly of dead religion is rife in the church. The number one reason why people don't come to church is because of Christians. Dead religious Christians. Those that people don't want to mix with. Those that condemn people all the time. Those that judge others and do not know that God will judge them with the same judgment. Amen. So listen to this. Instead of, of the sinners making Jesus unclean from the outside, he was making them clean from the inside. You see, Jesus had a plan sitting down with the tax collector and the sinner. He knew that that outside stuff couldn't make him unclean, but he could make them clean from the inside out. And that's what God is doing today. He's cleaning people from the inside out. He's changing hearts this morning even in this congregation. The grace of God ministered through Jesus Christ isn't limited to righteous people. It extends to sinners, even to the kind of sinners that disturb righteous people. The kind of sinners, have you been disturbed by some sinners? Have you been disturbed by some people's behavior? Don't stop loving them. I love what one minister said once. We love the mess out of people. I love that. How many of you love that statement? We love the mess out of people. The more you love them, the more that stuff comes out of them because they realize that you're representing a different kingdom. Live in a, live, uh, uh, live in a living relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that brings life. You and I, come to that relationship with God. Let us not just be religious, but let us be in a relationship with Jesus so that Jesus can infiltrate every part of your heart, every part of your life, every part of your family, every part of your community. If a true Christian is following Christ. Everything changes, not just their life, but their family's life, their neighbor's life, their work colleague's life. You will influence people around you. It won't just be the bad and the ugly they'll see now. They'll begin to see the good that God has placed inside of you. Your wife, 
your children will experience the good life that God has called us to, and that's to receive Christ and to live according to His ways. Amen.